is Lashana Sorrell, and I am the Director of Brand Engagement here at Vulcan Parking Museum. We are so excited to have you on this um, call. Uh, this presentation today is entitled Magic in Stone, the Heart of Silicaga. And um, we have the, I have the distinct pleasure of introducing our presenter today, um, Ruth. Beaumont Cook will be presenting to us and I'm going to read you a little bit about her and then I'm going to turn it over to her. I know you didn't come to, to see me and we will get started with that. So Ruth Beaumont Cook is a graduate of the Ohio State University. She has lived in the Birmingham area since 1970 and is the author of three books of narrative nonfiction history. North America, uh, North Across the River, 1999, Guest Behind the Bar, um, Bar Bed Wire, 2007, and Magic in Stone, which is her most recent in 2019. Her second book about the German POW camp in Aliceville during World War II was awarded a bronze medal for outstanding historical writing by the Independent Publishers Group in 2008. She is the author of numerous articles on history, business, and the arts for Birmingham Magazine, Alabama Heritage and other regional and national publications. Her Facebook page called Cook's Book Nook currently features virtual tours of outstanding sculpture collection pieces at the B.B. Comer Memorial Library in Sylacaga. She also maintains a regular blog, Road Trips, which highlights off the beaten path adventures around Alabama. Without further ado, I will introduce to you and um, to some and present to others, Miss Ruth Cook. And so I'm turning it over to you now. Thank you, Lashana. I'm really happy to be able to share this story this afternoon. Um, Silicaga's resource uh, has an interesting history. You can see on the screen here one of the dormant quarries on the left where the marble comes from. And I love the sculpture on the right because it kind of represents the, the rough stone and then the beautiful, beautiful sculpture that can be created from this white crystalline marble. Um, I want to give you a little bit of background on how the Magic of Marble Festival that's usually held every year in Silicaga, unfortunately, like much else this year, it, they could not hold it, but um, they've had it every year for 10 years and hope to have it again next spring. And I'd like to give you a little bit of background about that. In 2008, the Alabama State Council on the Arts decided to create kind of a, instead of a sister city, it was a sister state, sis, uh, sister city relationship between the entire state of Alabama and the city of Pietrasanta in Italy. If you're familiar with Pietrasanta, it's on the western coast of Italy in Tuscany, and it's where the Carrera marble quarries are. So um, they set up this festival, and it wasn't just marble. It was all of the arts of Alabama and all of the arts in that area of Italy. So in addition to sending um, sculpture information, and the mayor of Silicaga was part of that delegation that went to Pietrasanta in 2008. They also took a, uh, an Italian translation of Nell Harper Lee's To Kill a Mockingbird. They took some of the G's Ben Quilters. They took Jeannie Thompson, who is an outstanding poet here in Alabama, the artist Nall, and a number of others. And so they had this festival first in Italy. And then the following year, in 2009, the um, city of Pietrasanta sent a delegation to the state of Alabama. And in that process, um, Dr. Ted Spears, who is the director of the Comer Foundation in Silicaga, and his wife, Dr. Shirley Spears, who at that time was the director of the library, realized that there was a a very close connection between Pietrasanta and specifically the city of Silicaga because of the history of the marble. So they launched the first marble festival in 2009. And that's how I became involved because they asked me to create a very short history of the marble in Silicaga. And the brochure that you see on the right was the result of that request. Um, I did some research and put together um, that brochure for them. Um, 
later, it, that was successful enough that they decided they wanted an entire book. And the, um, the book Magic in uh, Stone came out this past year in 2019. But um, anyway, I was asked to do that. I didn't have a lot of background with sculpture and marble. Um, I did have a great appreciation for art. My college roommate was a fine arts major. And in the summer of 1964, and I'm going back a long ways, but in the summer of 1964, that was the New York World's Fair. And my roommate, my fine arts roommate was from New Jersey. She invited me to visit her family and to go to the World's Fair with them. Now, Italy's exhibit at that fair, incredibly, was Michelangelo's Pieta. They actually crated it up, brought it to Queens, and put it on display. And what you see on the left here is um, the way it was displayed at that fair with the blue lighting. It was, it was incredibly beautiful to see. The only, the only bad thing was you couldn't walk right up to it. They had a horizontal escalator and you get out on one side and go slowly past the sculpture and look at it. And I distinctly remember that my roommate and I got off of the escalator and went back around to the front and went back by at least four or five times so that we could truly appreciate that incredible piece of work. And I've given you a more detailed look at it over here on the right so that you can see what it looked like. So that was really my first awareness of incredibly beautiful sculpture. So I agreed to do this brochure and to do the research for the festival. And that was on, a, I think, a Wednesday afternoon. I drove back home. And my husband and I often in the evening would look for old movies on the AMC to look at. So that particular evening of all times, we decided to watch a movie, and you see two clips from it here, that starred uh, Patricia Neal and Gary Cooper. You may recognize this movie, you may not. But um, this was a story about um, a, a woman named, I believe it was Dominique Francon, and you see her uh, played by Patricia Neal here on the left. And she was, her father owned a granite quarry. And so she was up in her room looking out the window one day and she happened to spot handsome Mr. Howard Rourke down there in the granite quarry, uh, played by Gary Cooper. And so she decided that she wanted to meet this person. So she walked across her bedroom, there was a fireplace on one end and she picked up the poker and she smashed the corner of the fireplace. And then she called her servant and she said, you see that man down there in the quarry? Get him to come up here. I need him to fix my fireplace. So um, in strides Gary Cooper a few minutes later and she explains what she wants. And I'm sitting there watching this movie and he walks across to the fireplace, stoops down and picks up a chunk of what she had smashed. And I kid you not, he said what you see on the screen. This is Alabama marble very high grade, very expensive. And it was like, whoa, that's the stuff I'm gonna be writing about. So it was, it was kind of an interesting juxtaposition. Now, this is the book um, that came out of that. Um, I have it here in, with me also uh, called Magic in Stone. It's available if you'd like to go any further into this history, you can get it at the Anvil shop right here at the Vulcan Park and Museum or you can uh, get it through the publisher, New South Books, or order it from your favorite bookstore. But it is available um, all over the place. Um, now, I wanna go back and give you just a very quick geology lesson, if you'll bear with me for a minute. This is a sketch showing where that silicaga marble comes up out of the ground. And I wanna read you just a short paragraph from the prologue of the book that gives you the history of how this comes about. And notice on your screen, this is a huge bed of marble. It's 32 miles long, it's 400 feet deep approximately, and a mile and a half wide, where right by Silicaga. So here's how that comes about. 480 million years ago, shallow seas covered what is now Alabama's Coosa River Valley. Beneath the sunlit surface of these warm waters, a rich community of marine organisms, corals and brachiopods, bryozoans and trilobites, absorbed calcium carbonate from the water and used it to form their protective shells. When they died, 
they bequeath their shells to the floor of the sea. And then gradually, over the next 80 million years, the sea level lowered and a beach of sorts, we call it the continental shelf, emerged. Beneath this extensive shelf, rising layers of fossil shells shifted and compacted, creating loose sedimentary rock that was called chalk. Further sedimentation created limestone, which was harder than the chalk, but not hard enough to take a polish. And then finally, some of those layers, including specific ones in the middle of the Coosa River Valley, crumpled deeper into the Earth's crust, where heat and pressure drove out the impurities and morphed that limestone into a dense, white, crystalline substance. The Greeks gave us the word, uh, gave the world a name for this substance, taking it from their verb, marmorine, which means to shine or sparkle. This substance, which would come to be called marble, angles upwards between two layers of dolomite in the valley between Kahachi Mountain and Talladega Rebecca Mountain in what is now Talladega County. And you can see that on the, on the sketch there. These upthrusts of rock are known as Faltengebirge, which is German for fold mountains, because the layers all lean, as you can see, in the same direction, kind of like the folds of a pleated skirt. Finally, a mere 60 million years ago, as the sediment cover eroded, the marble itself was exposed and became, literally and figuratively, the foundation of Silicaga, the Marble City. And it is known throughout the United States as the Marble City. The first people in that area to actually notice the marble where it came kind of cropped out from the ground were uh, Native Americans from the Piqua Shawnee tribe, which had come down from Ohio in the late 1700s and settled along the river there. They called their village Chilakage, and you can see the evolution of Chilakage through a couple of iterations to the city, the, the town that we now call Silicaga. Now, we finished with the, genie, uh, uh, the uh, geology lesson. I want to give you a quick history lesson. Um, in 1814, if you remember Johnny Horton's song, uh, Andrew Jackson led American troops in um, uh, an attack against the Creek Confederacy in Northern Alabama. And by that time, these Shawnee tribes had joined that Creek Confederacy. And so he defeated them um, in 1814 in the Battle of Horseshoe Bend and the Battle of Talladega. Now, by 1832, you had settlers, European settlers, moving into the Coosa River Valley, and the Creeks who were still there signed the Treaty of Cusetta. And as a result of that, they gave up many of their uh, native lands there. By January 1834, the American government had opened a land office at Martisville, which is very near Silicaga, and they began to advertise those lands for sale. By 1836, as you know from your history, all remaining Creeks and other Native Americans in this area were ordered west out of Alabama, across Mississippi. Part of this was the Trail of Tears and part of them left in, in other uh, ways. But by that time, you had people buying up this land. This is a map from the archives from 1837 that shows that the, even that early, there were quarries being established in the area around Silicaga. Um, you can see there's, uh, there's one up here. There's another one down here. There's about three of them at that point. Now, one of the people who uh, began buying up that land was a man named Dr. Edward Gant. He had been a surgeon, a military surgeon in Jackson's troops during the 1814 uh, wars. And he had seen the marble in Talladega County, although he actually settled in Selma, Alabama after uh, all of that. He began buying up land and gradually became um, involved in quarrying the marble there in Talladega. Um, he used it mainly for memorial monuments and cemeteries. You can see one on the left here. Most of the um, uh, 
description on that one has been worn away by the wind, but down at the bottom, closer to the ground, you can actually see his signature there. That's in the Wigovka Cemetery. Another early developer was a man named George Hurd, who came from Scotland and was so impressed by the marble that he invited four of his brothers to join him in developing quarries in Talladega County. And you can see one of his monuments on the left here and his um, standard signature, which always appeared on those. The third of those men was a man who was referred to by everybody in that area as Alphabet Nix. And I'll, and I'll show you why. His actual official name was Joseph Madison Napoleon Bonaparte Nix. So it was just simpler to call him Alphabet. So those were the three men that developed the marble quarries before uh, the time of the Civil War. These two monuments, one by Edward Gant on the left, the one on the right by George Hurd, still stand side by side in Pine Hill Cemetery, which is just off the back of the campus in Auburn. Now, when you work on a research project like this, um, you have people come up and say, oh, did you know this? Or did you know that? Or I've heard this about that story. And I heard a number of those when I was working on the uh, early research about the marble history in Sylacauga. And one thing I was told was, did I know that the Washington Monument was made out of Alabama marble? And no, I didn't know that. And when I went digging, I found that no, that wasn't right. It was actually built out of Maryland marble, marble from quarries in Maryland and Massachusetts. But in the 1840s, when that was being built, the government sent out invitations to cities and states and um, fraternal organizations like the Masons and the Grange and things like that, and invited them to send stones that could be set into the walls on the inside of the monument. And those are still there today if you go up that, that uh, long winding staircase. Alabama actually has two of them and they, I have uh, pictures of them there on the left. The one on the bottom, was a Masonic Lodge um, entry. The one on the top is the official one for the state of Alabama. It was quarried at Gantz Quarry, Edwards Gantz Quarry, and it was lettered by Alphabet Nix at his um, shop in Montgomery. And they were sent by river barge uh, down to Mobile and then by ship up to Washington. Now, when the Civil War came along, as happened all over the South, industry and commerce came to a screeching halt with that defeat. And basically from the mid 1860s on up to a little after 1900, there was virtually no industry with the marble in the state. The quarries were there, but they were dormant. But in 1875, Eugene A. Smith, who was the first major geologist for the state, um, he every year or so would make a trip around the state and evaluate all the um, stone. He uh, rode in a buggy that was pulled by a mule at that point. And when he came to Silicaga, this is part of what his report said. And it was kind of prophetic because he could see ahead, he knew that this marble would have significant value in the future. We may reasonably expect someday to see this belt of marble become valuable property. At present, there's little demand for it. Though some years ago, quite an extensive business was carried on by Dr. Gant, Mr. Nix, and the Messrs. Hurd and others. So he was kind of prophetic in saying that. Now, another interesting point in the 1870s, Redfield Proctor at that time was a United States Senator from Vermont, and he owned several quarries in Vermont. And he heard some rumors about that really high quality marble down there in Alabama. And so he sent a couple spies down here to check it out. And when they came back, he wrote up a report and he issued a, a press release and said, Alabama marble is undesirable and the physical conditions at the quarry site are adverse to successful operation. He was only slightly right about that. Alabama marble is very, very desirable even today for a lot of reasons but the physical conditions at the quarry did make it difficult to quarry it at that time. You have to go down into the ground to get the marble in Alabama, where up in Vermont, it's 
kind of in the side of a mountain, so it's a little easier to get to. Now, this is another map from the archives in Montgomery showing, again, here's Silicaga as it was spelled then. You have Gantz Quarry down here. You have Alphabet Nix's Quarry way up here. The Herds Quarries here and a couple of others at that time. But the only thing they were producing at that time was grinding it up for flux in um, steel furnaces, and that even wasn't being done much. So it wasn't until 1900, um, and a little bit after, that the um, quarries became uh, valuable to commerce and to industry again. And the man you see on the left was primarily responsible for the early recognition of that. His name is Giuseppe Moretti, and he's very much entwined with the Vulcan Park and Museum, uh, which is sponsoring this talk today, because he was commissioned by the um, forerunner of the Chamber of Commerce here in Birmingham to create a cast iron statue to send to the World's Fair in St. Louis. It was called the Louisiana Purchase Exposition in St. Louis in 1904. You can see in the middle um, the building where Vulcan was on display during uh, that World's Fair. You can see how large that building must have been to have uh, Vulcan sitting in the middle of it. Um, Moretti's, you see him with the, his plaster model over on the left. His, his cast iron sculpture of Vulcan won the grand gold medal prize in metallurgy at that World's Fair. But most people don't know that he entered another piece in that fair, and it's the one you see on the right. This is Giuseppe Moretti's Head of Christ, which he carved in 1904. Um, he met a man when he first came to Birmingham named John Adams, and um, he saw a carving on Mr. Adams' desk in marble and said, where did that come from? It was just a little carving of a, an open book, probably a Bible. And Mr. Adams told him, oh, you know, there's some quarries down near Silicaga. Well, he had already insisted on going immediately and seeing that. And he made several camping trips out there with Mr. Adams. And he brought back chunks of this marble uh, to be able to carve himself. Um, but he very much wanted to promote the value of the marble as well. And he was also interested in owning quarries. Now, uh, I said, as I said, the quarries were kind of dormant from the 1860s forward, but obviously there were people who knew the quality of the marble even back then, because Julia Tutwiler, who wrote the, the song Alabama, uh, which was written in either 1868 or 69, in the second verse of that, she refers to the quarries where the marble white as that of Paros gleams. And Paros is an island off the coast of Greece, um, in the third and fourth centuries, it was heavily quarried for architecture and for sculpture. Probably the most famous piece uh, that was sculpted from Parian marble is the one you see on the right. This is referred to as either Wing Victory or Nike, and it was done from that marble. And whenever Moretti talked about Alabama marble or Silicata marble, he compared it to the crystal white quality of the Parian marble. He also always compared it to the marble of Carrera, which was why the Pietrasanta connection is so close to Silicaga. Um, Michelangelo, I like to say, whenever he went shopping for a new piece of sculpture, he went directly to Carrera to choose his marble. Now, the difference between quarrying marble in Silicaga and quarrying it in Carrera is the same as it is between Silicaga and Vermont. As you can see on the left, you, you blast and dig down to get to the marble in Silicaga. In Carrera and in some other uh, locations in the United States, it's, it's been up thrust much further. So you're going in, uh, into it uh, from the ground level and up rather than down, which is a little easier as far as structure is concerned. Now, Moretti, uh, when he was here in 1904 to do Vulcan, was so impressed with the marble that he decided to stay here. He wanted to develop quarries and to promote the marble. And in the very early uh, 1900s, he created several pieces that still exist today. Some of these you may recognize. The one on the left 
is a bust that he did of W.E.B. Davis, who was a prominent physician in Birmingham who died in a, a tragic carriage accident in 1907. And um, uh, I'm sorry, 1903. And Moretti was commissioned to create this bust of uh, Davis. It's inside the Lister Hill Library at uh, UAB. And there is also a bronze sculpture, which Moretti did outside of the same man. Now in 1907, he created this statue of Mary Cahollin, which if you spend much time in Lynn Park, you certainly have seen before. Um, she was the first school teacher at the Powell School in downtown Birmingham. And so he also created that. All three of these were done from marble from Gantz Quarry. In 1908, he created the sculpture of Father Patrick O'Reilly, which you see on the right. For a long time, this was out on the grounds of St. Vincent's Hospital. If you drive up to the front of the main building today, you'll see it off to the left. Now, this piece, um, which I don't believe has an actual title, this is a bas-relief cameo that Moretti created also in 1904. Uh, for his friend J.A. McKnight. And McKnight was the man with the, um, the local Chamber of Commerce who had first invited Moretti to come to Birmingham. Um, this piece remained in the um, possession of the McKnight family until 2011. And at that time, it was donated to the Vulcan Park and Museum. It's on display in the museum here now. And you can see it's a beautifully um, detailed piece of looks probably like a young girl with the bows in her hair. Um, nobody is sure who the model was for that, but I suspect it may have been the same person that you see in this piece on the left, which was also created in the early 1900s. Um, Al, uh, Marble was not named the um, Al state rock of Alabama till 1969, but it certainly represented it well. This is another very early piece done from Alabama marble. This was done by a man named Goodsam Borglin, and he um, used the um, Alabama marble, the Silicaga marble, to create this bust of Abraham Lincoln, which is still on display in the Capitol co complex today. If his name looks familiar, you may already have guessed this is far earlier, but this is the same man who created the um, President's Monuments on Mount Rushmore. Now, as I said, Moretti was very interested not only in sculpture, but also he, he kind of was an entrepreneur. He wanted to promote quarries and develop them and be successful that way as well. So when you get to the early 1900s, there are really two different stories about how the, the marble industry developed in Silicata. The first was with Giuseppe Moretti, who owned three different quarries in the area over a period of about 22 years. I'm gonna tell you his story first, and then we'll talk about the Alabama Marble Company. Um, when Moretti uh, owned, his first quarry that he owned was closer up near Talladega, and he built a whole complex there. He, he wanted to have like an Italian artisan village and he wanted to have a, a, a studio there and so on. And so he built a place called Montepino. And one day he came back down to a luncheon at the uh, Chamber of Commerce here in Birmingham, the group that had originally invited him. And Julia Tutwiler, who was the president at that time of the Alabama Normal College in Livingston, Alabama, which is now the University of West Alabama, had come to that meeting as well. And her purpose was she had an art student at the Normal College that she was very impressed with. And she wanted to find some scholarship money to send this young woman to Chicago for further study. So she brought several small sculptures up. She had put them in a little market basket, got on the train and came up to the chamber luncheon so she could um, ask for donations for this scholarship. The young woman that she was representing was named Geneva Mercer. She was from Marengo County and she was extremely talented. Well, Mr. Moretti saw those little sculptures and his reaction was, she doesn't need to go to Chicago. I want to teach her myself. He invited her to become his apprentice 
and um, she became a part of his household, of his studio, and um, was with him and his wife for the rest of his life and his wife, uh, wife's life. And that's another whole story. But this is the young woman, Geneva Mercer. This is a piece called Joyous Boy that she created. The original of this is in the Phipps Conservatory Gardens up in Pittsburgh. And the piece on the right is called The Flimp Fountain. If you don't know what a flimp is, that's a word that Geneva made up. It was a combination of flower and imp. The flimp fountain has all kinds of little fairies that come and cause the flowers to bloom in the spring in your garden. And that is on display in the Montgomery Museum of Art. So he proceeded to teach Miss Mercer and he also assisted him with larger pieces. She helped put up the armatures. Um, she um, helped with whatever needed to be done on his major commissions. Sometimes she just sat on a stool and read to him uh, while he was, was sculpting. But as she put in her diary, he also taught her to sculpt. He had her sculpt hands in every different position, had her copy famous works. And what you see here is a plaster of Paris copy that she made of his original uh, Head of Christ. And this is still on display in St. Jude's Catholic Church in Sylacauga. Now the Moretti Hera Company, which Happy Moretti and a, um, an investor named Hera from Philadelphia, I believe, established in 1912, was an extremely successful company. But unfortunately, Mr. Moretti was not involved with that company after about 1914. He didn't have the, the um, uh, investment cash to stay involved with that. But the company was extremely successful on up into the 1960s before it was merged into another company. In 1939, um, you, I'm sure you have heard the story, when Vulcan left St. Louis and came back to Birmingham, he had a very um, un, inelegant uh, history for a while. They took him off of the train and kind of dumped him out by the fairgrounds and he sat out there for a while. At one point they stood him up and put up, um, I think, was it a Pepsi can? They put, anyway, they advertised something in his arm there. And it wasn't until 1939 that the funds were gathered to um, develop the, the tower where um, Vulcan is today. And in 1939, the rotunda, the stone rotunda that you see on the bottom here was built and lined with $6,000 worth of marble from Silicaga um, on the inside of that. And then the Vulcan statue was put up on top. John Adams, who was Moretti's good friend, said that this was a tribute to Senior Moretti's proving of the value of the marble of Alabama. Now there was a little bit of controversy. Um, Mr. Moretti died in 1935 and Vulcan was put up in 1939 and the developers of Vulcan um, had their hearts set on displaying Moretti's head of Christ as part of the Vulcan uh, display. But um, Dorothea Moretti, um, Giuseppe Moretti's wife and Geneva Mercer had other ideas. They wanted, and um, Maria Bank had o Owen, who was the director at that time, I believe, of the archives, they wanted that head of Christ to be displayed at the archives in Montgomery. And um, part of the reason was these columns out on the front are all marble from Silicaga. And Dorothea Moretti wrote uh, in 1940, right after the uh, Vulcan was set up. It is precisely in order that future generations will know when they see those magnif magnificent columns that the artist Moretti was the first moving force that in his phrase brought that beautiful marble to light. So they wanted that recognition for it. And today that head of Christ is on display, uh, has been on continuous display since the 1940s at the Archives Building in Montgomery. Now the other early quarry development was done by a company called the Alabama Marble Company. And this was Gant's quarry, uh, which had first been uh, quarried by Edward Gant, whom I told you about. These are the four men who developed that company. Um, they came from, um, King came from the Washington DC area, Georgetown. William Harrison, who was called WP, came from South Carolina. 
William Runge had been working for the Georgia Marble Company and came over to Alabama one day and was so impressed with the operation, he stayed. Raymond Gardner was from New Jersey. They came from all over the country, but they eventually became the four major owners of the Alabama Marble Company. This company um, was highly involved in architectural use of Silicata Marble. The Brown Marks building that you see downtown in Birmingham uh, was built in 1906, and much of the um, ornamentation on the inside of that building, particularly on the first two floors, which are being restored, is Silicaga marble. Also, I don't have a photograph here, but the Lyric Theater, the flooring in that is also from uh, Silicaga. And this beautiful building, which if they just, if the uh, environmentalists and those who wanted to preserve historic buildings had just come along a few years earlier, we might still have this beautiful terminal station, which was built in 1909. Um, you can see the use of the marble inside. It was uh, heavily used in the development of that beautiful building. The building on the right in this slide, the US Post Office building in, Mo in Mobile, which also was torn down before the uh, preserving people came along. All of this uh, trim on it was Silicaga marble. The Select Council Chamber in the City Hall in Philadelphia, which does still exist, um, all of the white marble that you see in this building also came from Gantz Quarry. Now, I had also been told that the Lincoln Memorial was built of Alabama marble. That's not entirely true, but there's an interesting element of that memorial that is Alabama marble. If you look up here at the ceiling, those translucent panels, they chose marble from Gantz Quarry for those panels because it has, it has not only is it crystal white in appearance, it can be, it can be sawed to an eighth of an inch thick and still have its strength. So if you, if you um, get it to an eighth of an inch thick, it's translucent. And they wanted that to be able to have the light, the natural light come down upon the statue. So this part of the Lincoln Memorial is from Alabama. And that was done in 1922. An interesting sidelight in 1933, the Alabama Marble Company was sending a shipment of marble north to a client and the train derailed uh, up near um, Vintner in Northern Alabama. And a lot of that marble spilled out on the side of the tracks. If you've ever been to the Ave Maria Grotto in Coleman, Brother Joseph Zettel is the one who created all of the, the little miniatures of buildings and several grottos. This is the grotto of um, uh, St. Maria, St. Teresa of Lusso. Uh, and all of this marble that you see around it, and if you walk along that grotto walkway, you see a lot more of it, came from that train wreck. And it was carted there by the monks for Brother Joseph to use. This is the uh, United States Supreme Court building, which was built in 1935. And there is a great deal of Alabama marble inside that building. Um, the, uh, the wainscoting and the trim on the windows and the doors on the first two floors is almost all from Gantz Quarry. But the Moretti Hera Company, which had a different part of the quarry, also played a role in that. If you look closely at, this, at the um, uh, left-hand photo here, these pillars had been, were, were quarried in the moretti Hera quarry, and then they were sent to Tennessee to be polished, and they became the 16 pillars that are in the um, hallway outside the main uh, judicial room inside the Supreme Court. This is the altar inside St. Jude's Catholic Church in Sylacauga. Um, the four owners of the Alabama Marble Company donated all of the marble from Gantz Quarry for this altar, for these stairs, the flooring, and um, the uh, kneeling places all are done in that marble. And you can see this is um, Geneva Mercer's Head of Christ, and that's on the rear wall of that sanctuary. Just a few quick pictures here to give you an idea of 
kind of what it looked like out there when things were being done. This is 1916 when they were still using steam to pull the, uh, for the derricks to pull the chunks of marble up out of the quarry. Um, these are some of the men who worked in the finishing shop. Um, I talked to people who uh, remember, not 1916, but later when these men worked there and they said they would come out of that finishing shop just covered head to toe in white marble dust. And they had air hoses and would hose each other off before they went into the showers to clean up at the end of the day. In the 1920s, they switched from steam to electricity. And this is a photo of one of the saws. Um, they would run water and sand down over the marble. And then these saws would come down and cut it to the various widths that they needed for orders they had. This is Le Leon, Leon Deason. He's sharpening the the points that went on the channel um, machines that drilled in to release the marble. Charlie Adair, this is 1938, and the, they had a, by this time electricity, so there would be an engine, a motor back here, and it would power these belts. You can see he's operating the belt that lets them sand and polish the marble. Now, in the 1930s, um, Unfortunately, with the coming of heavy industry, you also had a lot more pollution in the air. And the um, architects and the um, contractors began to realize that marble had a problem with pollution and that granite was much um, less susceptible to that pollution. And so gradually in the 1930s, they shifted away from using marble for buildings, particularly on the outside of them because of the pollution. But fortunately, the owners of uh, Moretti Hera and of the Alabama Marble Company were far thinking enough that they began to look for other uses of the marble. And one of them, it still kind of makes me cringe when I have to tell about it, but they went from slabs of marble used for beautiful architecture and sculpture to grinding it up into a very fine powder called GCC. It's basically calcium. And GCC is ground up calcium carbonate, which they began to manufacture. And it was a highly successful shift in business. Now, you may or may not be familiar with this, but if you eat bread that says calcium fortified, it has marble dust in it. If you open up a, a piece of gum and there's powder you know, between the foil and the gum, that's GCC. It's in your paint thinners. It's in, uh, you know, those diapers that um, the uh, uh, non-cloth diapers for uh, moisture, all kinds of uses today. So they were able to save the industry uh, by switching completely to that. And from the late, from the late 1930s on up to today, more of the marble was used for that than it was for structure. And over the years, Georgia Marble came in and, and bought up some of these companies. There were all kinds of mergers that went on, um, particularly after World War II. Um, and you can see there some more piles and piles of that GCC uh, being ready for shipment. Today, there are two major companies in Sylacauga uh, that operate the commercial part of the industry. AMIA, Alabama Carbonates Division, produces carbonate filler and coating grades for paper and packaging. Emerus, which is the largest um, uh, mineral company in the world, based in France, but they have uh, offices in the United States. Um, Silicaga is a key component in their calcium carbon carbonate. In fact, it's the largest of their calcium carbonate mines in the world. So you went from sculpture and architecture to ground up powder, and then in 2009, which you've already heard about, um, when the State Council on the Arts began promoting um, the arts of Alabama, the city of Sylacauga decided to continue supporting the marble resource as an artistic um, uh, resource. This is a sculpture that was done for the very first Marble Festival by Reno Giannini. It's still on display in the uh, Comer Library. You can go and see it. And he, his theme was 
we're all in the same boat and we certainly are. Um, 2010, they brought another, the, each year they bring a master sculptor from uh, Italy and then they invite sculptors from across the United States, even some from Canada to come and sculpt in Bluebell Park. They put up little funeral tents and they run power from the uh, Bluebell factory through the storm sewers so they can work there for 10 days and create their own sculpture. This is Giovanni Balderi who came in uh, 2010. He created this beautiful piece called The Mask. Here are some more photographs of the uh, sculpture. If you'd like to see more of this, you can go to my Facebook page called Cook's Book Nook, which right now we're conducting a virtual Marble Festival tour um, of various pieces that have been done over the years. And that's kind of like an appetizer for next spring's festival. This um, piece of um, Ulysses um, and Penelope is the one that's currently being featured on that page. Now, just very quickly, um, in the course of the Marble Festival, um, Silicaga has acquired a resident sculptor. His name is Craiger Brown. Um, he's a graduate of the University of Montevallo and has created some incredible pieces uh, during his tenure there. And I wanna show you, this is a piece, the first major piece that he created. It's now on the grounds of the City Hall in Silicaga. And there's the chunk of marble it came from. And here's Craiger working on it out at the city uh, yards where people could go and watch. It's called Silicaga Emerging. And you can see why. It's literally a sculptor carving his own way out of the local resource of the marble. It's a beautiful piece. And as I said, it's on the city hall grounds. Um, Craiger Brown has created a number of other pieces. This particular piece is on the grounds of Ivy Green, the childhood home of Helen Keller, and you can recognize what the theme is here. This is the moment where her um, teacher put her hand under the pump and she made the connection between water and the word water. His most recent piece is part of the new sculpture garden at the fine arts, um, at the scu sculpture garden at the fine arts museum in Montgomery. It's an incredibly beautiful place, especially at night. And this piece uh, is dual. It has two sides. Craiger's on the left, and he created the um, uh, more modern side of this. And the man on the right is Italian um, sculptor Marcello Giorgi. It's called Nostra Luna. And you have a more contemporary lady in the moon, so to speak, on the one side and the more um, classical on the other side. Um, again, okay, so that, that's the end of my lecture, by the way. Just one more reminder, this is the book that what I was telling you today came from, if you'd like to have a copy. And um, I believe, uh, Lashana, do you have some questions for me or? I do not. So I do not have any questions in the chat. Feel, feel free if you have any questions to um, type them into the chat function now. But I would like to thank everyone for joining us on the call. And um, just as a reminder, Vulcan Parking Museum, part of our mission is to advance knowledge and understanding of Birmingham's history and culture and to encourage exploration of, a re of the region. And I think that this presentation um, fits with that mission. And we're so appreciative to you, Ruth. Thank you so much for um, for taking time out your schedule. Um, we do have the book, as you mentioned, um, available um, inside the Amble, which is open from 10 a.m. to 6 p.m. Also, if you like these types of programs and would like for us to continue with these programs, please feel free to um, go to our site and make a donation. Your funds are helping us to be able to keep offering programs like this throughout the year. So thank you so much and I appreciate everyone. And you all have the, enjoy the rest of your afternoon. My pleasure. Thank you.